I'm going to go ahead and set the webinar in three, two, one. Hi, we'll be with you in just a moment. We're just waiting for everyone to sign on. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the webinar, Breast Cancer in the Environment. I'm Deb Hackenberry, Program Project Manager. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a nonprofit organization that has been helping people through breast, metastatic breast, ovarian, and uterine cancer for the last five, 45 years by offering the support of those who have been there. SHARE provides many services, including a helpline, support groups, and educational programs. All of our services are free of charge to participants. For more information, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. All participants today will be muted during the presentation. When the presenters finish presenting, we will begin the Q&A discussion. You are welcome to submit questions during the presentation through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. The chat section will be disabled. When asking questions, remember that the presenter is unable to give specific adv medical advice, so please keep your questions general in nature. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SHARE website soon. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Sharima Rasanayagam, PhD, is the Director of, of, at, of Science at Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. She works to ensure that the organization continues to be a national leader in science-based environmental health advocacy. She oversees all of the organization's science-related activities. Before coming to BCPP, Sharima was the founding academic coordinator uh, at the UC Berkeley Institute for the Environment and served as consul for science and technology at the UK Consulate General in San Francisco. Polly Hoppen, uh, uh, SCD, is a research professor and program director for environmental health at the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production, University of Massachusetts, Lowell. Dr. Hoppen is a co-founder of a national partnership and related regional initiative, which seeks to integrate environmental carcinogens into cancer-related research policy and programming. Prior to her arrival at UMass, Dr. Hoppen was a senior advisor for environmental health at the US Department of Health and Human Services and the Environmental Protection Agency. Roxana Amaya Fuentes, M MPH, is the Eco Healthy Child Care Program Assistant at Children's Environmental Health Network and Market Shift Node Coordinator at Cancer Free Economy Network. At the Children's Environmental Health Network, she works to protect the developing child from environmental health hazards and promote a healthier environment. At Market Shift Mode, she works to transform businesses to reduce exposures in impacted communities by changing the underlying incentives for companies to shift away from harmful chemicals to safer alternatives. Now, uh, now if, we would, I, if we would like to begin. Off you go, Polly. Great. Um, I am so delighted to be here with um, all of you as are uh, Sharima and Roxana. Um, my work focuses on prevention of chronic diseases uh, first by understanding the science that is relevant to what causes disease and also what keeps us as a society stuck in doing things that make us sick. So with that understanding, our center works with partners around the country to catalyze change in that stuck system towards a world where no person is made sick because of the water that they drink, the air that they breathe, the food that they eat, the products that they use, and the places where they live, learn, work, and play. So we're going to give you a little bit of a high-level overview of this issue of cancer and where environmental chemicals fit in. Um, and then we're going to drill down with Shreema's presentation uh, into breast cancer in particular and steps that you can take both as an individual and as an individual contributing to larger societal change. And we'll conclude with Roxana talking about a really interesting specific project that's part of this network that we, that we are working on together. Uh, next slide, please, Steph. So this is the start of the PANMAS challenge. 
Um, our family got started on this ride after my husband made it through two years of grueling surgeries and chemo. And the funds raised by this ride and so many others that I'm sure many of you have participated in go almost exclusively towards research on treatment and support of cancer patients. And as you all know better than anybody, this is absolutely essential. My husband would not be alive today without this. Imagine that's the case for many of you. But there's a lot of pent up leftover energy, passion, and resources beyond this that are left largely on the sidelines when it comes to preventing cancer, and especially when it comes to understanding how the environments that surround us contribute to cancer, and then developing strategies to try to address those to reduce cancer risk. And that's why we're so grateful that you're here today because you are getting off the sidelines with regard to that issue. Next slide, please. So it's really clear how much this investment in treatment has paid off. Um, in the case of childhood cancer, you can see the graph at the bottom that show substantial drops in mortality from cancers for children under 20. And we need this trend to continue so that no childhood diagnosis, cancer diagnosis is a death sentence. But look what else this slide is showing on the top in the red. That is the rate of new cases of cancer in children, not just total numbers of cases, but new cases as a percentage of the population. And that's been going steadily up since 1975, about 41%. So in addition to the lost lives that this trend reflects, it's also no picnic surviving cancer, as many of you know. And kids often face a lifetime of impairments and associated high costs of being cancer survivors. So it shouldn't be that our goal should be only to reduce mortality but also to prevent cases of cancer uh, from the beginning so that the trend line that you see there on the top uh, reverses and starts going down. Next slide. Just gonna go through a couple of others that are basically the same message. Here we are with the case of breast cancer um, where the rate of new cases has also gone up over time, although in the last four years, only slightly, and mortality is going down as well, again, only slightly. This slide is a reminder of disparities, in this case, between white women and black women, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the hour. Next slide. So this slide is especially interesting. These are cancers that we know from scientific research are particularly sensitive to environmental chemicals. And look at the trends here. Um, breast cancer is also one of these, and Shreema will talk more about this later. But here are others. And the trends in the incidence or the percentage of cases of cancer, again, steadily up, although there is some good news in the last couple of years, and we'll see if that continues for some of these. Next slide. So although those incidents were trends were going up, for cancers overall, and I'm sure you all have heard this generally good news that uh, cancers overall are going down in incidence. And we see declines nationally when we add them all up. Um, this is primarily because of dramatic reductions in smoking that have come from taxes on cigarettes, labeling of cigarette packages, restrictions on advertising, public health programs, just a whole array of efforts to reduce smoking. It shows that prevention works when we see these kinds of results from successful prevention campaigns. And yet, Rates of lung cancers in people who never smoke are going up. Um, a recent study that our center published took, looked, uh, developed a model that looked at how much of smoking-related cancer would have been prevented over the last 20 years if we had succeeded in eliminating smoking altogether 20 years ago. And the answer was a lot. So again, we need to continue to focus on smoking cessation. But there were a lot of cancers, even though that those that are smoking related, that would not have been prevented, even if we've been successful in eliminating smoking. So what else is going on? Um, we, we think that environmental chemicals have um, a serious amount to do with it. Part of that comes from looking at the differences in the amount of cancer that would be presented if we eliminated smoking, depending on what county you live in. And those counties that are more urban, that have higher levels of environmental exposures, are those that would benefit less from eliminating smoking. 
So this too, the issue of reducing pollution and contaminants also needs to be a focus of cancer prevention. Next slide, please. So here's just an array of um, exposures that we need to be concerned about. Um, our pots and pans, the materials made there, exposures we're familiar with on the horizon of, of smokestacks of various kinds um, from manufacturing, adhesives used in tile and flooring, um, chemicals in our couches, pesticides on our food. Um, these are all sources of concern um, and documented um, carcinogens. Next slide, please. The science has really strengthened over the last number of years, um, tying environmental exposures to um, cancers. And that has been in the arena of toxicology and animal testing, and also in the arena of epidemiology where we study populations. One of the most accessible reports that I really recommend on the left, although it's quite old now, it's still very current in its content, is the President's Cancer Panel Report um, that took a look at occupational environmental exposures for a whole year um, and concluded that the contribution of environmental and occupational exposures to cancer has been grossly underestimated. Next slide, please. So just shifting now to the Cancer Free Economy Network and this really exciting um, collaboration that we're part of and that we hope you will be interested in joining. Um, we are basically up to solving a very complex problem, which again is a system that is stuck in the production of toxic chemicals that impacts um, workers from the moment of extracting petrochemicals from the ground, all through the life cycle of the manufacturer of those chemicals, their emissions um, into our air, water, uh, and food, their disposal as hazardous wastes, um, ultimately impacting our physical selves. And then another part of the system, healthcare, to incur high costs in paying for the treatment of these chronic diseases. Next slide. So just to give you a quick sense of uh, how this uh, network got started, it was a collaboration among people from across that system. So the business is producing toxic chemicals, uh, policymakers, elected officials who are in the position to make decisions to change laws, uh, health scientists and practitioners, affected communities, including those that are disproportionately exposed, often low-income communities, uh, people of color. So we got together to understand this system. And I'm gonna give you just a quick sense, next slide, of uh, some of what we looked at. There are dynamics in the system that are uh, keeping us stuck. And this is a good example. If you look over here on the left, um, we have a policy that effectively does not require testing um, of industrial toxic chemicals before marketing. That leads to minimal understanding of health impacts. We then have industry saying, well, there's not enough science. And um, so they then are able to effectively oppose regulation. Scientists themselves sometimes contribute to this stuck narrative because they often say, well, I'm a scientist. I am hesitant to say that something's proven. And they send out messages that are quite skeptical. Um, the next element of the cycle is the, that that results in a dominant narrative for the public where people just say, well, gosh, I guess nobody really understands this and therefore kind of throw, throw up their hands in despair um, about what to do. That conveys a weak message to policymakers um, where they don't hear from the public that this is essential that we address this and that leads to regulation remaining weak. Next slide. So I'm not gonna go into detail because of time, but here's an example of a dynamic in the system that is going in the right direction, actually driving progress. But this one uh, where we have evidence of health uh, problems turning into um, motivated companies that produce something safer um, with consumers adding to the mix of uh, increased demand for these kinds of things, that's still relatively small. So how do we amplify that up so it really catalyzes change? Next slide. So this is just a quick um, diagram of the Cancer-Free Economy Network. We have four work groups that you heard mentioned in the beginning with a number of different activities in each of these work groups. It's a really exciting effort to be involved in 
Um, lots more detail that we can share with you at another time, but this gives you a sense of the breadth of activity that is happening. Next slide. So that's it. Um, again, we'll return at the end to just invite you to join us and thanks so much for your attention. I'm gonna pass it over now to Sharima, who's going to do a deep dive into breast cancer. Thank you, Polly. And thank you so much to Deb and Steph for setting this up and doing such a great job in, and inviting us to be here. So I wanted to talk to you, I'm sharing my slides. Somebody tell me if you can't see it. Um, Hopefully you can see this and you can hear me. Um, so uh, specifically breast cancer and uh, the environment, what do we know and what can we do? So as I said, as, as we said at the beginning, I'm the director of science at Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. We're based in San Francisco, but we're a national organization and we are a science-based advocacy organization working to prevent breast cancer by eliminating our environmental exposures to toxic chemicals and radiation linked to the disease. So what do we know about breast cancer and the environment? Well, there are a number of really well-known risk factors that I'm sure everybody on this call has heard about before um, and that are, that's in the media and people know about. Um, for instance, um, uh, pharmaceutical hormones, uh, HRT uh, has been very, uh, com combined hormone replacement therapy has been very strongly linked to uh, uh, ER positive breast cancer. Um, and everybody's heard of the BRCA genes. Uh, and so individuals have, uh, some individuals have a genetic susceptibility, but it's actually only about 10% of breast cancer diagnoses that can be directly um, uh, linked to genetics right now. Um, and so there's over 90% where there's an environmental um, impact as well. So some of these other ones, breastfeeding is protective, um, uh, pregnancy early and, and a number of pregnancies is protective against ER positive uh, breast cancer, not so much against uh, receptor negative breast cancer. Um, how old you were when you first got your period, menarche and menopause, and how old you were when you uh, went through menopause has an effect. Um, and all of those, those uh, reproductive factors are to do with your lifetime exposure to your natural estrogens. Um, so um, uh, tobacco is on here, smoking has been linked to increased breast cancer, both uh, primary smoking and secondhand. Body weight is on here, and that's an interesting one because uh, Increased body weight after menopause is, is a risk factor for breast cancer, while a higher body weight before menopause may be uh, may result in a lower risk of premenopausal breast cancer. So we're not quite sure what's happening there, but there's um, a lot of research going into that. And then physical activity is protective no matter when you do it and for all forms of breast cancer. So get out there and do some exercise. Um, so those are the well-known risk factors. We actually, Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, we spent about four years uh, doing a report for the state of California, which was uh, funded by the California Breast Cancer Research Program on all of the factors besides genetics that influence breast cancer. Um, and so we did this uh, incredible literature review of the science, looking at all of these, and we ended up with 23 factors that we looked at. And we came up with a report called Paths to Prevention that you can get on our website, bcpp.org, where we put together an action plan looking at all of those 23 risk factors and coming up with initiatives to create systemic change to stop breast cancer before it starts. So we focused on, as, as we've said before, primary prevention, stopping the disease before it starts. We looked at it with a social justice lens to see, look at disproportionate impacts on communities who are vulnerable, and we spoke to communities, asked them what would work for them uh, rather than trying to dictate uh, interventions. And we focused in this, um, in this report on systemic change. So what can we do as a society to decrease exposures uh, linked to breast cancer? So what can we do to make it easier for somebody to exercise rather than telling somebody that you need to do more exercise? What would make it easier for someone to exercise in their neighborhood? How can we ensure that every neighborhood has access to fresh food um, and healthy food? Um, what can we do to um, 
decrease the chemicals that are in our water and in our air and in the products we use. So looking at that systemic level as opposed to what sometimes can sound like blaming the victim in saying, telling people that they have to do a lot of individual work. But today I want to really focus on, on chemicals and radiation linked to breast cancer, which is what we at BCPP have focused on for over 20 years. So that's chemicals in consumer products, chemicals in our environment, in our water and in our air, chemicals we may be exposed to at our workplaces um, and in our homes. Um, and then also some of these physical uh, factors that affect breast cancer, uh, which includes ionizing radiation, um, mostly through medical uh, diagnostics, um, and also light at night, which was a surprising one to me, but, uh, but has more and more evidence linking it to increased risk of breast cancer. So when we're talking about chemicals, radiation, breast cancer, what are we talking about? Well, at BCPP, we are concerned about chemicals that are carcinogens, and these are have been specifically linked to cancer through um, by authoritative bodies like the World Health Organization um, and the uh, National Toxicology Pro Program here in the US. And these are chemicals that are designated carcinogens. They cause cancer. We're also concerned with breast cancer with hormone disruptors because um, a woman's lifetime exposure to estrogen is, 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 uh, is, is key to her overall breast cancer risk. Um, we are concerned with any um, chemical that disrupts the body hormones that looks like estrogen, looks like progesterone, or may change how the body reacts to hormones. So these are endocrine disruptors or hormone disruptors. And then, as I said, there are these physical agents like light and light radiation that also have been linked. But it's really important to realize that these risk factors uh, don't act in isolation. It's any individual may be exposed, uh, two individuals may be exposed to the same exposure, but depending on their life stage, uh, what their genetic makeup is, uh, where they live, how stressed they are, uh, and what else they are exposed to, they could have a very different response to that exposure. So the life stages that are particularly important for breast development are prenatally, uh, in the womb, uh, during childhood, uh, especially adolescence and during puberty when the breast, breast is developing very rapidly. During pregnancy, anyone who has been pregnant knows that your breasts develop very rapidly during pregnancy. And actually the breast does not um, complete its full natural development until after a woman has, uh, has given birth and breastfed her baby. Um, and, and that is one of the reasons why breastfeeding is actually protective against breast cancer later life uh, because your, your breasts have fully developed and are therefore less um, prone to cancer. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about was mixtures and low doses. So um, a lot of um, companies in particular who are using some of these toxic chemicals, as, as Polly said, in their, in their products will say, well, the level's too low to cause any real health effect. But the thing is we are exposed to the same chemicals in multiple products in multiple places at the same time. So those very small doses can build up to become doses that would then have an effect. So that's called cumulative doses. And also when we're talking about endocrine disrupting compounds, compounds that um, affect our home hormones, well, our natural hormones work at really tiny levels. And so anything that um, affects hormones can work at these really low doses. So sometimes even these doses that we, we we think don't seem to be very high that our body can react to them if they're hormonally active. So um, Polly already mentioned this exposures linked to breast cancer and, and elder cancers can be found in, in our everyday environments in our air and water, in what we are exposed to at work, um, pesticides and herbicides, uh, which can be either that the, the agricultural workers work with, but also that our um, residues on, on the food that we consume. Um, uh, it can be, they can be found in consumer products, uh, both personal care products, food packaging, cleaning products. Um, and then, as I said, there's ionizing radiation and then hormone supplements. So what can we do? So this will be uh, individual. So what can we do about these exposures? So what can we do as individuals in our homes, in our workplaces, within our communities and state and nationally? So I'm gonna start off talking about what we can do ourselves uh, as individuals and in our homes. And 
how I've structured this is to go through the kind of exposures you might encounter throughout the day and what you might be able to do to minimize your exposures. Um, there are a lot of chemical names that I could go through, um, and I put some of them up here. You will have heard of some of them. You may not have heard of others. And I'm not going to, I'm going to try and avoid alphabet soup in this talk, but detailed information on every one of these chemicals and the science linking it to breast cancer uh, can be found on our website, bcpp.org. If you go onto our website and search for any of these chemicals or any others that you're concerned about with breast cancer, um, you can get the full details there. So typical day, what do we do? Well, I wake up and I go through my morning routine. Um, I use soap, or shampoo, uh, a little bit of makeup, um, and all of those personal care products can contain uh, chemicals linked to breast cancer. You may have heard of some of them like phthalates and formaldehyde releasing preservatives and things like that. And so what we say here uh, for an individual is to, to look at the products you use and see whether um, you can swap some of them out for safer alternatives. So how do you find out what safer alternatives are? Well, we have what we call our red list of uh, chemicals of concern that we think should not be in personal care products or, or cleaning products or fragrance. Um, and we call this the red list. Um, but to be honest, that's a really technical list. It's a lot of chemical names and, and numbers. Uh, it was really written to help manufacturers and retailers know what to put in their product or not to put in their products and what to not to stock on their shelves. Uh, but that our red list has been incorporated into a number of other really consumer friendly um, apps and resources. So one thing I like to use is Clearia, um, and that is both a smartphone app and also a um, web browser extension that you can use while you're online shopping. Um, you can get it in the Chrome web store. Um, and that will actually, when you're on Amazon or Sephora or a couple of other online, big online stores, it will give you a rating for any product you're looking at and tell you whether it's got chemicals of concern in it and also what might be a better product, a, a safer product. Think Dirty is another smartphone app that has a, um, a barcode scanner in it, with, which if you have a smartphone, you can scan a product that you're looking at in the shop uh, and it will give you a rating and also tell you what might be a safer alternative. The other thing you can look for is some of these third party certification schemes. EWG has a, a nice one called the EWG Verified at the Environmental Working Group. And then Made Safe is somebody who I've worked with and I'm on their um, advisory committee on, and they have a Made Safe badge. And if you uh, get products with these badges on, you know that they, they are free of the worst ingredients and actually are, have pretty safe ingredients in them. So that was your morning. I know that was a lot, but then uh, if you have kids, you might be taking them to school. And I just wanted to point out the schools are a wonderful place for local advocacy. Um, so um, parents can help make sure that their schools, that their children go to are free from pesticides and harmful cleaning chemicals. And also that children have access if possible to fresh organic meals. Now, why is organic, uh, uh, important, it, will, it reduces your exposure to pesticides. Um, so organic foods are not, do not use uh, chemical pesticides in their production. And a, pesticide, a number of pesticides have been linked to uh, health effects, including breast cancer. Um, and so that's what we want to try and uh, minimize our exposure to pesticides, but also uh, with uh, packaged food to uh, reduce exposure to, to some of the um, chemicals that you might find in cans and in plastic like phthalates and BPA. Um, not only does uh, using, uh, choosing organic foods help protect uh, the kids and the people who are eating, but also it protects agriculture and food workers uh, and reduces environmental contamination. Now, the other thing with plastic uh, is, well, we're all trying to reduce our use of plastic, but uh, definitely don't microwave in plastic. When you heat up plastic, some of the chemicals that are part of the plastic will leach out into your food. So you want to avoid that. So to avoid heating up plastic, including in, in the microwave. All right, and if you're working, if you do work um, with hazardous chemicals, which a number of, of women do, um, work is a, is a place to advocate for transparency and safer chemicals. So 
ask what you're working with, ask whether you have adequate protective equipment. And if you, if you are provided with protective equipment, make sure you wear it and make sure it fits. So we've done a lot of work in San Francisco with the San Francisco firefighting department, which actually has the highest uh, proportion of female firefighters in the country. And what they found a few years ago was um, they all had great protective equipment, but um, most of it had been designed for larger framed men. And so some of the women, the equipment didn't fit so well. And so there was a, a lot of work we did uh, and that they did uh, to ensure, and now that there is equipment that fits the, the relatively smaller framed women and fits them well and helps protect them. The other thing about if you do work with, uh, with chemicals in the workplace um, is to try not to bring those chemicals home. So leave the protective equipment at, at the uh, facility if you can, uh, shower before you leave if you can, or at least um, make sure you, you uh, shower before you, you, greet, you greet your family if you're working with, with particularly worrying chemicals. Outdoor time after work. So sun protection is important. Um, skin cancer is a, is, is, a, is a real issue and we, we need to, to protect ourselves from the sun. Unfortunately, some chemical UV filters stimulate estrogen, uh, which as we know is a problem for breast cancer. So we recommend choosing mineral sunscreens, um, which have non-nanoized uh, titanium dioxide or zinc oxide. Um, also to not use spray sunscreen so you don't inhale any of the sunscreen. Um, the cream ones are great. Um, or, to, or protect yourself with a hat or clothing. Also for the outdoors, uh, avoid using pes uh, chemical pesticides in your home and yard. There's a, there's a number of integrated pest solutions that, that can, you can use which do not involve uh, chemical pesticides. After school, well, hopefully we are all washing our hands a lot more than we used to. Um, and washing hands uh, with plain soap and water not only reduces uh, infectious disease, but also can help reduce exposures that, of chemicals that pile up in dust. Um, what we do say is try and use, uh, just use plain soap and water. A lot of these antibacterial soaps, um, they used to contain trichosan, they also contain other things, but and they're not really they haven't been shown to be any more effective than plain soap and water. Um, so best to avoid those. Um, and also um, just take your shoes off at the door. You don't want to track in dust that contains chemicals that we are concerned about. Going back to, to food again. Um, so yes, as I said before, trying to limit consumption of canned foods to avoid BPA and other bisphenols. The canned food industry is moving away from BPA, but we're not quite sure what's in the cans right now. Um, so if you can avoid it, do. Uh, frozen food is a great option. Um, with cookware, tr um, try and avoid nonstick pans that are made with PFAS chemicals. So use ceramic coated or cast iron. Um, PFAS is perfluorinated alkyl substances, and these are called forever chemicals. They take for they they don't break down in the environment, and they've been linked to a number of health effects, including breast cancer. And then uh, try and limit your alcohol consumption. Um, alcohol uh, has been found to be very very strongly related to increased risk of breast cancer. Cleanup times. So. Uh, a lot of uh, cleaning products do have uh, chemicals of concern in them, like endocrine disruptors and fragrances. And here um, you can look out for this badge, the EPA Safer Choice badge, which is actually a, a great badge that shows um, that a cleaning product has been made with safer ingredients. Um, when you are cleaning in the house, uh, we suggest using a wet mop and a HEPA vacuum instead of sweeping or dusting, because um, that would um, that gets the dust up into the air where you could inhale it. So it's best just to use a wet mop uh, and HEPA vacuum. And I, I want to say a little bit more about fragrances. Try and avoid uh, products that just have the word fragrance on the label because there are a whole bunch of chemicals that can be in there. Um, and then and uh, companies that disclose their for all of their ingredients, including what's in fragrance, um, you, you at least can then use one of those apps that I talked about before to, to see how whether there's any concerning chemicals in their fragrance. But if they just use the word fragrance, you don't know what chemicals they're using. 
screen time in the evenings, uh, we all do it. Um, but our, uh, I just want to talk here a little bit about electronics disposal. Our electronics are made with all kinds of chemicals, uh, including flame retardants um, and, and a bunch of other worrying chemicals. So when we do dispose of our electronics, it's important to do this responsibly so they don't just go into a landfill and then those chemicals end up in our water, uh, at water systems. A lot of states, I know New Yorkers as well, have um, take back programs where um, retailers who sell electronics will take back those electronics to dispose of them responsibly and, and batteries as well. So make use of those programs. And then when you are using uh, screens at night, try and minimize the blue light because that affects the light at night effects on breast cancer. Bedtime, and this really is about all furniture, uh, carpets and mattresses. We want to make sure that they're free of flame retardants, which have been linked to breast cancer, and also these PFAS chemicals, which you find on a lot of um, uh, stain resistant um, um, products. So you want to look for natural for flame retardant barriers. There's some great ones. I mean, wool is a wonderful flame retardant barrier for, um, for furniture. Um, and also look for PFAS free products. A lot of um, furniture these days has to be labeled whether it contains PFAS or not. So just look out for that label and try and avoid the ones with PFAS. And then finally, nighttime, uh, making sure your sleeping space is as dark as possible and free of blue electronic lights when you sleep. Now, this is an area where there's more and more research that shows that um, increased light at night is related to increased risk of breast cancer. Now we're not sure what the mechanism is precisely that could be about melatonin levels, because um, if you are exposed to light when you're meant to be sleeping, um, you don't build up as much melatonin as you would in a natural sleep cycle. Uh, it could be related to sleep deprivation and sleep disturbance, and it could be related to stress. But there's, there is um, more and more evidence that light at night is, is related to higher risk of breast cancer. So. Um, Wearing a sleep mask is a really easy intervention there if, if you can sleep with a sleep mask or get light blocking curtains. Now, I know a lot of people do work shifts and they can't avoid having to sleep when there's a lot of light outside. So just when you do sleep, try and make sure that your sleeping space is as dark as possible so you can hopefully get enough sleep and, uh, and get enough melatonin buildup. So that's what we can do individually. I just want to talk a little bit here about what we can do um, collectively to improve uh, exposures linked to breast cancer. And this is what we, we at BCPP call our policy advocacy work. So we work in a variety of areas. We look at, as I said, home exposures, so consumer products, including personal care products, food packaging, cookware. We work on workplace expo exposures, trying to uh, get stronger worker protections including for salon workers. Uh, we work on community exposures, looking at air and water pollution uh, and looking at hazardous waste sites. And then we work to, um, to increase the amount of research into breast cancer primary prevention. There's some wonderful research going into um, earlier detection and, and cures. Uh, we think there needs to be um, a little bit more attention uh, as well paid to primary prevention. So we put all of our thoughts and, and suggestions and everything that we're working on into a policy agenda that we uh, presented to the new administration when they came in in January. You can see that on our website and you can see all of the recommended actions we have in there for breast cancer prevention and, uh, and, and what we're doing to, to try and achieve that. And we can't do any of this without help from people like you uh, we have an action center. If you go to our website, you can see this where you can see what we're doing, the, the bills we're working on. I actually have really good news for that California bill. This is, I took this screenshot three days ago and it's already out of date. So uh, the California action, uh, Governor Newsom yesterday signed the bill that we were pushing through in California to get PFAS uh, chemicals out of food packaging in California, paper-based food packaging from 2023 in California will not be allowed to have um, uh, perfluorinated chemicals in it. Um, we currently have a, uh, a package of four bills at the congressional level, at the national level, looking to uh, have safer beauty for all. Um, and that includes uh, banning the worst of the worst chemicals, uh, forcing disclosure of fragrance chemicals, 
helping ca uh, companies know what's in there in their products that they're making by making the suppliers to those companies tell them what's in there, which doesn't always happen right now. And also um, a whole, uh, a, a bill looking at how we can better protect women of color and salon workers uh, from the worst of the worst chemicals. So please join us uh, to, to, to reduce our exposures, both as individuals and as a community to uh, chemicals linked to breast cancer. Uh, you can see all of uh, these uh, resources on our website and uh, thank you. And that's my email. I'll put it in the chat later as well if you have questions that we can't get to today. Thank you. And I am going to hand it over to Roxana. I know this is really quick. Uh, thank you, Sharima. I'll go ahead uh, and get us started. Hi everyone, my name is Roxana. I am the Eco Healthy Child Care Program Assistant at the Children's Environmental Health Network. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we are also a national organization that focuses on protecting children from environmental hazard exposures and our work focuses on environmental justice, climate change, uh, childhood cancer and child care and also Cancer Free Economies uh, Market Shift Node Coordinator. So I'm going to discuss our Healthy Spaces project that I became involved with um, about a year ago through Cancer Free Economies Emerging Leaders Cohort Program. Um, so the Emerging Leaders Cohort Program focuses on supporting emerging leaders, especially those individuals who identify as BIPOC and overall goal is to build a larger, diverse and prepare leadership pool within Cancer Free Economy Networks and its member organizations. And I selected the Healthy Spaces project because it caught my attention and it was an angle of human health that I had not considered before and I was mentored uh, by Polly. So a bit of background on our project. Um, the overall goal was to increase awareness of the relationship between human health and the built environment. So we spend the majority of our time in some type of indoor um, environment, whether it's our homes, workplace, when we're spending time with friends and family. And also due to the pandemic, uh, this has increased. And with these types of built environment, we could be increasing our environmental hazard exposures um, from building materials. So building materials may contain harmful chemicals, for example, flame retardants, volatile organic compounds from paint, and many more um, that may lead to short or long-term um, adverse health effects and can also be harmful to the environment. And um, with building materials uh, throughout the life cycle that can also be harmful, for example, manufacturing, building, um, demolition, and disposal. And some materials may not be easily disposed or recycled, which uh, also harms the environment and also those that are working in, in these industries. And chemicals may be released um, by offcasting. So for example, this is when chemicals are releasing to the air, like from paint, uh, degradation over time as building materials begin to age and break down, oxidation. So this is uh, burning or rusting. So in the event that there is a fire, um, these harmful chemicals are released uh, into the environment. And also um, this can affect uh, firefighters. And this topic is important because there tends to be a lack of awareness or not enough attention um, between like the built environment and human health. Also, usually um, in construction or renovation projects, um, budget plays a big role. So safer materials uh, may not be easily uh, accessible. And uh, initially we were going to uh, develop renovation guidelines and select safer building materials and replace some of the furniture inside Cancer Bridges. Uh, so Cancer Bridges is a cancer support space um, in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, which I will go into more detail in the next slide. And the process uh, for this project was I took a healthy building networks, free modules on building materials. Um, I researched case studies um, of cancer support spaces that have taken a similar approach to create a safe, a safe and healthy uh, indoor space. And as of right now, we have focused on the educational aspect of this project. Uh, we developed a green cleaning guide and also educational placards to be installed inside um, our uh, cancer bridges um, that I will explain um, in a bit. So our clubhouse is now called Cancer Bridges after two organizations merged together. 
and they are um, based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, this is open to anyone who has been impacted by cancer in any way. Uh, so that's patients, families, and friends. And it's a space for individuals to engage in several activities, for example, um, clinical support, social activities, and support groups. And our Healthy Spaces project is a pilot study uh, and an ongoing initiative to identify these toxic substances used uh, within indoor spaces and facilitate a transition to safer um, alternatives to improve individuals' health outcomes. So there has been a, a gap between the relationship between human health and the built environment. Um, an example of a case study that has taken um, this approach is Hope Lodge in Houston, Texas. So Hope Lodge is a part of the American Cancer Society program, and they provide housing for cancer patients and their families free of charge and provides a nurturing um, home-like environment. And they also provide a variety of information and report, um, so, sorry, um, support resources uh, about cancer. And currently there are more than 30 Hope Lodge locations throughout the United States and Puerto Rico. And this has been a great example of being able to address cancer from the environmental health um, aspect, uh, especially focusing on building materials um, since the beginning of the construction stage to reduce uh, patients and their families or caregivers exposure to environmental hazards. And since we decided to focus on the education aspect of the Healthy Spaces project, um, we decided on the idea of developing and installing educational placards um, inside Cancer Bridges. So the topics that we cover were cleaning and disinfecting products, fragrance, indoor and outdoor air quality, furniture and carpet, and how these may affect human health. And we also didn't want to make the placards um, so overwhelming with so much information. So we decided to include a QR code in case someone wants to learn more about one of the topics, um, they can scan the code. And this would take them to a landing page with more detailed information and resources. And another purpose of the code is to be able to keep the information updated as new scientific information or resources uh, become available. And the placards uh, will be installed um, in the bathroom, kitchen, and other common gathering areas. And one of the main um, aims for this project is to also be a model for other cancer support organizations who may be considering a similar transition. Um, cancer Bridges and the Cancer and the Environment Network of Southwest Pennsylvania's um, Outreach Working Group has also been putting together a virtual speaker series that cover um, a range of health topics, including environmental risk factors of cancer and what can be done at the individual level to reduce exposures. Um, for example, learning how to select fragrance-free products um, that Sharima uh, went over previously. And so I will share um, this video. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And we hope that um, you were able to gain something from our presentation and also learn more about the role of environmental chemicals in cancer. And, um, and in particular, and most important, some of the actions that you can take to reduce your risk, uh, the risk of your friends and families. And so we wanted to close with a short video that was um, organized by the Health and Science Node of the Cancer-Free Economy Network of cancer leaders and also health professionals encouraging us all to become more involved. Roxana, we're not hearing the video. Are you able to um, share with sound? And if not, we can just give you all a link to this and you can um, listen to it afterwards. Um, did the link not work? The visual works, but not the sound. And I know oh. we've been with that before. Okay. You know what, I would suggest that we give you um, 
a chance to watch that at another time and, and turn to some questions before we wrap up. Thanks, Roxana, so much for the great presentation and also for trying with that video, and, but we'll find another way to get it to people. Okay. Well, thank you guys for a, a wonderful presentation. So uh, with the, the remaining time that we have, let's start the Q&A. You can submit questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get through as many of the questions as we can, uh, but due to time constraints, we may not. And everybody, I, I, all the presenters, I believe, are giving you access to uh, their email addresses. So if, if any, if you have questions that have not been answered, you can reach out to them and they will get back to you. So I'm going to uh, start with some of the questions we've gotten uh, when people registered, as well as during the course of the presentation. Uh, oh, one of the first questions we got is, do, shut, do studies sh show reducing these chemicals also reduce recurrence? Yes, yeah, so we did um, at BCP, hi, thank you for that question. And thank you again for, uh, for bearing with us on this. Uh, but we did a study, we had a study group on this. There has been less um, research on the effect of environmental chemicals on outcomes following a diagnosis of breast cancer. But we did a lot of, uh, we did a big study on this a couple of years ago. And actually, if you go to our website, we have an area where we, and on every chemical that we talk about, where there is evidence on the effect on recurrence or mortality we, uh, or, or any outcome after a diagnosis, we, we do note that. And we have a specific um, tip sheet uh, which goes through the, the top tips for women living with a diagnosis. So I will put the link to that page directly in the chat. But there is less, there needs to be more research on, on, uh, on the effect of environmental exposures post-diagnosis. I'm just putting a link to a review article um, about that with regard to breast cancer that you might wanna look at as well. Uh, another person wrote in, I see warnings um, all the time on things I buy and that they don't meet California standards and or contain materials that are known carcinogens by the state of California. Do state mandates like that have an effect on manufacturers? Um, so there was a really great law paper that came out, um, uh, was it last year, um, which looked at, and that's called Prop 65, that label. Um, it, it was the, the um, it's the result of a proposition in California from about, I don't know, 30 years ago, 20, 20 or 30 years ago, um, Prop 65 warnings. And there's a lot of criticism of them because they can, they just say this product, you, you're not quite sure which chemical they're talking about or what it is about that product. But having said that, um, uh, UC Berkeley School of Law did a really interesting study looking at the effect of Prop 65 warnings. And they found that what actually was happening was uh, a lot of companies would like would not want to put that warning on their product, and so they were reformulating privately in the back so that they wouldn't have to put that warning on their product. So it has actually been pretty successful in getting rid of uh, chemicals that are on that list out of products. Um, and I can try and find that. It's a really long law review article, but um, but it was it was it was really interesting that that we're finally beginning to see the impact of labeling laws like that. If you could choose only one thing to avoid as an exposure, what would that be? I, I, I always say just pick one thing that's easiest for you to start with, because there's so much stuff. Um, I, I just replaced my pots and pans, actually. That's what I just did. Um, and, and it was, you know, and there's, and I learned how to uh, how to use cast iron properly. <laughs> um, Polly or Roxana, have you got any? I would just add to the spirit of what you said, Shreema, which is that you know there's there's a tendency to sort of feel overwhelmed by how much is out there that is of concern. Um, but every step is a good one, and if you whatever you can do most easily is um, just where you should be focusing on. Um, it's, it's really difficult to say that there's something that's more important than other things. We don't have the science on that. Um, and also it's, you know, everybody's cancer is an individual situation, a convergence of 
um, you know, genetic issues with exposure issues. So it, it's really difficult to say. I mean, certainly, um, you know, as Shreema pointed out, alcohol is a big one. Um, and yet, yeah, alcohol also has some benefits in terms of kind of uh, social connection and reducing um, people's stress, which itself is a risk factor. So yeah, um, do what you can, but, but don't stress too much about it. Another woman has, has written in, I've, I've read some that even the chemicals that are approved for organic food can be harmful. Should we just throw in the towel and try to buy local? Uh, local's great for climate change reasons. Um, yeah. Um, but um, so, uh, yeah, so something being natural doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. So, I mean, arsenic is natural. So, um, yeah. So, yes, there, there is an issue that, that it's not just the synthetic chemicals. Um, cadmium is a problem, um, and that's naturally occurring. Um, but, um, but, yeah, trying to get fresh. Um, if you can get it organic foods, um, frozen is a great option. Um, but, yeah, um, it is, it is a, a, I, I have a lot, I, I do do a lot of, um, by saying, yeah, just because something's natural doesn't necessarily mean it's safe, so. And overall organic though, uh, really does have a much lower fault profile in terms of the um, outside inputs that are used yeah. um, on it. Yeah. And Friends of the Earth just did a great study where they found that if people um, changed their diet to a predominantly organic one, um, they, they could have measurably less pesticide residue in their bodies within just a few, a few, uh, I think over two weeks. So it, it really does work to reduce your body burden. Um, you had mentioned uh, concerns about uh, microwaving in plastic containers. Do you have any recommendations about what types of containers should be used? I just empty stuff into glass. So if I, if I get something that's in plastic, I just put it into glass. Glass is a really great inert, uh, container material to use. And that is a great example of an easy step, which um, you know you do it often enough, if you're like me, <laughs> that um, you really do reduce exposure substantially by making that change. Yes, I also just add that even if um, like a container says microwavable safe, um, that you shouldn't put it like in the microwave and instead use glass like Polly and Sharima mentioned. Is funding for research increasing or decreasing? Holly? That's a very good question. Um, it, it is um, increasing a bit, which is terrific. You know, the particular kind of research that gets really short shrift, as I mentioned in the beginning, is research on environmental contributors. But one exciting development, we were involved in helping the American Association of Cancer Research organize a three-day meeting on environmental carcinogenesis uh, pathways to prevention, which was the first time that that august, you know, global organization uh, renowned on cancer research had ever really addressed the environment. So this effort to um, call for attention to environmental chemicals in arenas where cancer organizations um, are very active is, is really beginning to have uh, make a difference. One of the things I would encourage everyone to do is if you have bandwidth is to get involved in your state cancer coalition. There's always one in most states because the Centers for Disease Control funds state cancer prevention control programs. But those coalitions very rarely have people that are speaking up about the environment. And we're, we're about to launch a series with CDC focused on state cancer prevention control uh, government decision makers. And if at the same time, more people who are concerned about environment start participating in cancer coalitions statewide, we can really begin to, to shift the narrative there, which itself will have an impact both on research, but also on um, programming and, and prioritizing that those um, programs will do to elevate the issue of environment. Well, I think that's a, a great place to end the pr today's presentation. And I wanna thank you, Sharima, Roxana, and Polly for a very informative program. And thanks to all of you for participating and submitting questions. If you could please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey will show up in the browser when the webinar ends and the link will also be in the follow-up email. All surveys are anonymous. Thanks and, and bye.
Thank you so much for having us. Thanks so much. And we'd be happy to follow up with anyone in through the emails that we included in the chat if you have further questions or, or would like to become involved in some of the work we're doing. Thanks so much.